We have a good one for you tonight. Hello and welcome to the Sports Affinity webinar presented by the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. FJMC is the parent organization of over 200 conservative men's clubs around the world. FJMC has presented more than 100 webinars since the pandemic began. We work hard to provide value to our members and to the Jewish community in general. For example, FJMC offers you an opportunity to express yourself through participating in and leading activities that are most important to you. I'm Dave Kravitz with my co-chair, Danny Mando, and we will be hosting tonight. We're going to mute everyone so we can enjoy the presentation. We'll be un unmuting after the presenter's remarks so we can take questions from chat. If you're enjoying our webinars, please validate your support with a contribution to FJMC by going to fjmc.org slash donate. We'll put that link in, ch in chat. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Eli Dershowitz, Dershowitz. And let me tell you a little bit about him. Um, actually, he has accomplished so much at a young age that it's, it's, it's mind boggling. So Eli attended Temple Israel Natick Mass and was a bar mitzvah there. Uh, he, Temple Israel Men's Club is a member of the New England Region Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. He has a bachelor degree in history from Harvard. In 2014, Eli won the U.S. Men's Sabre Championship, becoming the youngest U.S. Men's Sabre Championship holder. Eli won the 2015 Junior World Fencing Championship in Sabre, becoming the inaugural U.S. Men's Sabre Fencer to win a world title. He is a four-time Pan American Games Championship title holder and the 2015 Pan American Champion in Sabre. Eli competed in fencing at the 2016 Summer Olympics. He returned to Harvard University as a sophomore, winning individual Sabre in the 2017 NCAA fencing and as a junior in the 2000, 2018 NCAA fencing championship. He won a silver medal in Sabre at the 2018 World Fencing Championships. He was awarded the honor of being a banner bearer during the opening ceremony at the Maccabea Games in 2017 and won two gold medals. He represent, represented the United States in fencing at the 2021 Olympics in Tokyo. It is now my honor to, to present to you, Eli Dershowitz. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here, um, and I'm excited to talk to you all about, you know, my early life growing up, um, you know, as a young Jewish athlete, um, you know, in 30 minutes west of, of Boston and Massachusetts, um, and how, you know, the mix of, you know, fencing, um, you know, helped me travel the world and got to experience, um, you know, so many great places. And then my mom, Renee, and my dad, Mark, um, all of whom have been, you know, tremendous support, um, you know, throughout my career as an athlete and, you know, helping me in any way um, that they can. Um, so I started fencing at age 10. So that was 16 years ago. Um, and at the very beginning, it was just, you know, a recreational thing I did, uh, you know, I enjoyed it, enjoyed going to practice with my older brother. Um, and then, you know, as I went through middle school and high school, I dropped the other sports that I played growing up. Um, and then when I got to college, uh, I decided that, you know, it was something that I really wanted to dedicate, you know, several years of my young life to pursuing, um, you know, the dream of, you know, winning an Olympic medal. And as I continue, you know, training full time, um, I'm also an assistant coach on the Harvard fencing team now, um, kind of continuing to train there, but also, you know, mentoring and coaching, you know, the generations behind me. Um, you know, I, I really feel that my years as a member of the team and as an NCAA athlete were some of the most fun and rewarding years of my life. Um, so to be able to give back um, in that way to the younger generations is something that, you know, means a lot to me. Basically, uh, I'll start with, um, you know, my earlier years um, in international fencing and, you know, all the amazing places I've been able to travel. Um, I feel very fortunate that I've been able to compete um, and travel to over 40 countries in the world throughout North and South America, Africa, Europe, and Asia. Um, I definitely feel like that experience gave me the ability to meet people from all across the world, from different backgrounds and cultures um, and religions. And uh, I really feel like that helped shape me as a person. Um, and then the, the 2017 Maccabee games were, were huge for me, just being able, it was my first trip to Israel. Um, and I made so many close friends on the US team there. Uh, it was truly you know, an, an unforgettable experience that yeah, I actually set up 
um, together at the tournament are still dating since then. And they're, they're two of my best friends. Um, so I'll always have that to hold on to. Um, unfortunately, I will not be able to go to the MACB games this summer. Um, I really wanted to go. I really wanted to be the flag bearer for, for the U.S. Um, at the 2022 MACB games. But unfortunately, the timing didn't work out. Um, the senior world championships, which I'll be competing in, are in Cairo, Egypt, on the exact same day um, that the MACB games are. And it's just, even though it's a quick fight, there is just really no way to make the timing work. Um, but maybe someday in the future, I can go back, you know, as a coach, uh, you know, and, and be able to travel around and experience the entire country again. Only the two weeks before the athletic competition kicked off where we were able to travel the entire country, um, you know, with a big group of athletes and just be able to see and, you know, to experience that, you know, especially your first time um, in Israel with like a huge group of friends was just something that was really special to me. Um, and then having my family there that they came to watch uh, me compete was, was, was something that was truly special to me. Um, and from, you know, like a family perspective, uh, a lot of my, my grandparents, you know, uh, originated from Poland. Um, and I, I feel very lucky that uh, I've been able to compete in Poland, I think, eight or nine times now in my life um, in the under, seven cat, under 17 category, under 20 category, and in the open category. Um, they, they host fencing competitions every year. Um, and historically, my best results have always been at the, at the Poland World Cup. Um, and it's always been a very emotional uh, a tournament for me. Um, my mom always told me that her parents, who are regretfully no longer here, um, would have been you know, so excited and um, you know, so happy that I was able to travel back to the country that they left um, before or during World War II, um, you know, the country that they fled to be able to go back and, you know, win, you know, an international sporting competition there um, is always something that, you know, was very meaningful to me. And every year, you know, my mom would always tell me that, you know, they'd be so proud that, um, you know, a country that, you know, they had to leave 80 years ago was now welcoming, uh, you know, an American Polish, um, like, uh, heritage uh, kid back, you know, with open arms. And even though the, the, the Poland national team was never, you know, super strong, the fact that when an American Polish um, kid would, would be winning these tournaments was always, always deeply meaningful to me. Um, and, you know, I'm, it's, it's always been tough to talk about just because, you know, it's, there's like a whole, variety of, of factors that go into like going back to a country that you know your, your ancestors you know left um but just having you know that familial connection has always been something that's you know pushed me to like compete just a little bit harder the normal international fencing season for for uh you know most of you probably aren't too familiar with it is um a string of eight international uh, world cups is what they call them followed by the world championships um in the summer we do have a, the next World Cup is in Budapest in two weeks. So that is currently what I'm training for. Um, and while I continue to train for, for these tournaments with, with the Harvard fencing team, the fact that I'm also coaching, um, you know, gives me a little bit more confidence in, in, in what I'm doing. It makes me a little bit, you know, happier with what I'm doing. Um, so after I get home from the uh, Budapest World Cup in two weeks, I have one day of rest and then I fly out to the NCAA tournament with um, this team, uh, which will be held in uh, South Bend, Indiana, uh, hosted by Notre Dame. Um, so th this March is going to be a little bit hectic, but uh, hopefully, uh, you know, later in the spring, I'll have a little bit more time to focus on, uh, you know, my own training, my own competitions. Um, Besides from competing in, in Poland, the other place that has been, uh, that I've only competed in once, but it has been probably the most special tournament in my career was the 2015 Tashkent Uzbekistan. Um, like David said earlier, uh, I won the world title, the under 20 world title at that tournament in Uzbekistan and um, you know, became the first American male in, in saber fencing to ever win a world title. Um, but it was meaningful to me, especially because my mother's father um, and his family, they fled east from Poland to the Soviet Union um, right before the start of World War II. And they settled in um, Samarkand, Uzbekistan. 
Um, and we had, my family had this very old photograph of the graveyard um, from decades ago that where, where my, some of my family members were buried. Um, we searched basically the entire cemetery for, it was a Jewish cemetery. We, we searched for so long, it was several acres. Um, and we were unfortunately unable to find the grave that Max, the picture, just because the, the groundskeepers had told us that so much renovations and so much had changed over the years that there was really no way to place where in this very large um, cemetery the picture was. And I had a, you know, a small army of, of teammates and friends and coaches and everyone that was willing to, you know, walk around the cemetery and, you know, try and help me find this was definitely one of the most special moments in my life. Um, and, you know, the, the locals there were, were so kind and, you know, they were so helpful to the fact that, you know, I was looking for, for you know, uh, an ancestor that, you know, probably hadn't been visited in, in, in decades, you know, and it's not that often that, you know, someone uh, traveled to Uzbekistan. So that was definitely one of the highlights of my, um, my entire, you know, fencing career slash life. Um, and then when... Um, I'll, I'll, I'll go back a little bit. Um, that was in 2015, um, after my, at the end of my freshman year of college. Um, when I started as a freshman, I was definitely a good saber fencer for U.S. standards, but I really hadn't, you know, um, like made my mark as, as a like consistent dominant, you know, force on the American, on the American team. Um, so that that world title in the U20 category definitely gave me the confidence to say, OK, after my freshman year, I'm going to take an entire year off. I'm going to train professionally for the first time in my life for. Had very little social contact with 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 that many people, all of my, you know, hometown friends growing up with, they were out of college. All of my friends from college were still on campus. So basically for that entire year, um, you know, I was, I was sleeping, training, lifting, grinding, and, and really trying to, to make my, you know, big come up to get into the older age group. Um, and I feel very fortunate that, you know, like my family and my friends and my coaches, you know, gave me so much support to really help me get there. Um, and I ended up, up to the Rio Olympics um, and then unfortunately did not get the result I wanted um, but really that that type of you know loss that type of regret really helped motivate me to train even harder for my next three years in college um, like David said earlier I ended up my sophomore and junior year in 2017 and 2018 winning the NCAA tournament um, and then in two senior spring I was actually unable to compete at the, the NCAA championships because there was an international tournament um yeah so this past summer um at the Tokyo Olympic Games uh it was definitely a really tough experience training you know so hard for an entire year leading up to what was supposed to be the 2020 Tokyo Games um, and then we got word that you know because of the COVID pandemic it was going to be postponed another 12 months um, and that was definitely the, the toughest struggle that I've ever had as an athlete. Um, when you pour like your heart and your soul into training, and, you know, you pour everything you have into, into getting ready for a certain moment in time to basically be told that a lot of that effort was, uh, you know, not for nothing, but not going to be realized for another 12 months was, was, was really tough for me. Um, so I definitely took, uh, a break, you know, in the summer of 2020, when we were, we were supposed to be traveling to Tokyo and, you know, we were told we have another 12 months to go. Um, there's a saying that, uh, you know, the Olympics doesn't wait for anyone. Um, that was especially true during, during the COVID pandemic. Um, but, you know, kept training, kept pushing for, for another year. Um, and then showed up to the Tokyo Olympics, you know, ranked second in the world, um, ended up with a ninth place finish, um, which was definitely not up to the standard of where I thought, you know, I was capable of competing at. Um, but at the same time, uh, I've always believed that, you know, the only thing that matters long term is how hard you work and how hard you prepare yourself. 
Um, and I definitely believe that leading up to both Rio and, and Tokyo, I put, you know, everything I had in, into my training, physically, mentally, emotionally. Um, and that, that was definitely, um, something that was tough, but something that I'm looking forward to, you know, growing as a person, as an athlete in the next few years, I'll lead to Paris. Um, I feel very blessed of 2020. I met my, my girlfriend, Karen, who I now live with in South Boston. Um, and, you know, just having someone, you know, by your side, you know, all the time, you know, to be, you know, as a support system, as someone that, you know, care about as someone that cares about you is, is something that has really helped me um, decide that, you know, I really want to continue another three years towards the Paris Olympic Games. Um, and, you know, being so grateful for the support system that I've, I've had is something that's really helped me, I think, have an edge on a lot of my competitors. Um, I know everyone says that they have a great support system when it comes to like Olympic athletes, coaches, family, friends, significant others, pets, even my new dog, Jax, um, seven month old golden retriever is the cutest person in the world. Um, but yeah, all of that together um, really makes me, you know, grateful for the last several years of um, of my competitive, you know, athletic career. Um, and I'm really happy now that after Tokyo, I, you know, am able to be both a professional athlete and a Division One athletic coach at um, at Harvard University. Um, really, I'm pretty much on campus almost every day, training or coaching. And, some way so um it's been a really good way for me to stay stay focused and engaged in the sport as i you know continue to try and improve on a consistent basis um other tournaments that um, i haven't mentioned yet um, would be the 2015 pan american games in toronto canada shout out to our uh, our friend from toronto um and the 2019 pan american games in lima peru um, besides the Olympic games, these are like probably the biggest, uh, international sporting event in the world, probably accompanied with the university games athletes from, you know, every country in North and South America across maybe 50 sports. There's a big village cafeteria, social hall, just like you would see, uh, at the Olympic games. So, um, some people will call it like, just like a miniature Olympic games. Um, so those two tournaments were definitely, um, towards the top of, of my favorite locations that I, I've been able to travel and compete in. Um, just off the top of my head, you know, I've also been, um, I've also competed in, in Brazil and Peru and Cuba, Canada, Mexico, um, Korea, Japan, China, Russia. Um, I've been throughout all of Europe. I've been to Senegal for competitions, Algeria, Egypt, um, all of the Western European countries throughout all of Eastern Europe as well. Um, the 2011 world championships were in Amman, Jordan. And that was my first world championship event. Um, and that was a really cool experience. Me as well as the, the other athletes on the national team have had to be, you know, very flexible with, uh, the tournaments and the training schedule and everything getting moved around and canceled and travel logistics. Uh, it, it's really been a nightmare. Um, the last, you know, few years of the last two years of, of competition. Um, we were obviously, um, you know, with, you know, COVID uh, mandates, I actually got COVID two times at two World Cups in Luxembourg in 2020 and in Budapest in 2021. Um, luckily, I had no symptoms either time. But um, when it comes to experiences in other countries besides that, off the top of my head, I would say that my favorite places that I've competed were definitely the World Championships in Wuxi, China in 2018 that I got silver at. Um, and that's where the tournament that solidified me as like the number one say after that my favorite tournament would have been the 2013 u20 world championships in Poric, croatia um on a very nice uh secluded uh kind of resort city um you know right on the water um 
So when I, when I look back at, you know, all the places that I've traveled and stuff, I definitely think that, um, I've been able to experience things that very few people my age and just the fact that fencing is growing so much internationally has given me the opportunity to compete against athletes from literally every, every corner of the world and, and meet people that without my sport, I would have without a doubt, never met anyone from that country. Um, so uh, if anyone has any specific questions about any of the places that I've traveled or any of the countries or tournaments that, that I mentioned, you can feel free to, to put it in the chat and I'll try and, um, you know, either address it or, or add some information about it. Um, it's same city for, for some of the years to blend together and stuff, but uh, I usually have a pretty bad memory when it comes to most aspects of my life, but when it comes to fencing and remembering specific tournaments and events and results and, and experiences, I somehow, for some reason, have, have a very good ability to, to um, you know, remember like these very small details about, you know, all the people that I got to meet, all the people that helped me, you know, at, at these tournaments. Um, and uh, so now, like I said, I have the Budapest World Cup in, in two weeks. Um, and then after that, we have, I will be traveling to Seoul, South Korea in, in late April for the, our fifth World Cup of the year. Um, and then the last two World Cups of the season are in Madrid and Moscow in May. Um, obviously, right now, the, the Moscow World Cup is not going to happen in Moscow. So they're training, they're trying to located and that usually happens yearly um and then our world championships in july are in cairo egypt um regretfully like i said earlier during the exact same time as the maccabee games so i won't be able to have a, a second experience you know traveling the country and competing in the country and you know meeting a group of people and you know having that you know family-like experience um and then hopefully in August, I have the first two weeks of August, I will be, I now uh, also um, do some youth training camps in New York City with um, a private club there. Um, most of the national team in fencing is either centered in Boston or New York City. So I'm in New York City training a lot as is. So I'm um, like signing a deal with a private club in New York City to run youth training camps um, there has been something that's been, you know, one of the, the, the best highlights of, of my fencing career, um, just being able to make that transition from, you know, athlete to coach in like a day-to-day -day basis is something that's super fun. Um, and just seeing like the excitement and the energy and the love for the sport that these, you know, young athletes have between the ages of, you know, 10 and 18, um, there's a huge variety and being able to run these youth training camps and help these kids and travel to some of the youth national tournaments uh, on, on the U.S. circuit and, you know, see these kids be successful, see these kids, you know, grow as athletes, as people. And then as they start, you know, applying to college and stuff, it's just, it's mind boggling to, for me to see, you know, when I was in high school, when I was in college and, you know, little kids that I saw at the club or younger fencers that I trained with to see them now applying to college, uh, it definitely makes me feel a little bit older um, and a little bit more removed from the the sport but um i definitely try my best um to stay active in the community training um it's definitely the year after the olympics historically has always been a little bit easier training and competitive level uh globally um people tend to try and cycle through their training to try and peak right before the olympics physically and mentally and emotionally um, but when I am training, you know, at my absolute, um, you know, you know, when I was a little bit younger and more inexperienced, and I believed that I needed to outwork everyone in order to make it to the top level, I was pretty much doing two to three workouts a day, six days a week. Um, that usually includes four to five specific fencing practices a week, which are three to four hours of footwork drills and competitive bouting. 
um, four to five individual lessons a week, one-on-one -on -one, like drills with your coach um, in fencing, we call them lessons, but they're basically like tech technical and tactical work one-on-one -on -one with your coach. So four to five times that a week at about 90 minutes each, um, mixing in three session strength and conditioning sessions with my trainer um, that are about 90 minutes each per week, working on both mobility and flexibility, but also strength and power. Um, foot speed is very important, fencing, um, as well as injury prevention. Um, just the way our tournaments work and the way the sport of fencing works is each touch is could be a split second or a few seconds, but it's basically an all out sprint to ring the touch for a few seconds. And then you rest for a sec and then you start the next touch. The hold that takes on your body physically and your body hurts just a little bit more because the constant warm up, cool down, warm up, cool down definitely makes um, anytime something on your body doesn't feel right, anytime something is tight, anytime something is tweaked, anytime something is slightly injured, it usually gets progressively but slightly worse each of those matches. So um, definitely the strength and conditioning aspect, being able to make sure your body can withstand that type of um, like explosive movement for, for, for an entire all day event is huge for us. Um, and then when it comes to the, the mental uh, training of um, the sport, um, you know, working with a sports psychologist when I was younger in, in college definitely helped me believe that, you know, I belonged and that like I was, you know, uh, I deserved to be at that level and that, you know, it wasn't a fluke, it wasn't a one-time thing. Um, that type of belief system and, and confidence really helped me work on my consistency over the years as I got older and more experienced and, you know, didn't want to be the kid who got lucky and did well at a tournament, but wanted to be the kid who was consistently, you know, doing well on the international circuit. Um, and then when it comes to, you know, flexibility and mobility training, either doing um, yoga or, 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 you know, even on your off day, rest day, doing some type of active rest and recovery, you know, constantly rolling out, constantly doing your mobility exercises, separate yourself from the people who are good, from the people that are great. Um, and then when it comes to nutrition, um, I'm definitely a little bit more lenient now as, uh, as I understand, you know, what types of, you know, foods uh, will help me recover and, and, you know, and sleep better and perform better. Um, I'm definitely a little bit more lenient with myself now. And then besides from that, when it comes to training, I would say like video analysis is something that's been very big for me, something that I do as a coach with the Harvard team. And that, you know, just on my own, being able to look at the other competitors throughout the world seeing how athletes from different countries, um, you know, move in certain ways, you know, have certain technical styles, have certain like strategies and, you know, tactical, um, you know, plans, um, being able to understand how all these different athletes from all these different coaches, you know, like, um, train, perform and execute their plan is, is something that's really, um, important to understand if you want to make it to the high level. Um, I've always believed that, there's no such thing as too much analysis or too much preparation. Um, so I definitely have some doubters out there in the sport that think that the sport sometimes can be overanalyzed or the analytics can, you know, not paint a whole picture of the game. And I agree with that to a certain point. I think that the sport of fencing was a huge influence in who I am as a person. Um, and having the goal to, to give back and help other, you know, younger fencers try and experience the same things I did, travel like I did, get to meet people from, you know, all across the world like I did is something that's um, a huge goal of mine and something that I definitely want to continue doing in the future, even after I maybe retire as a professional athlete. When it comes to anti-Semitism in, in fencing, I can't recall actually ever experiencing any specific um anti-semitism in, in my sport um the most the the only thing i've really seen that could even be considered that is there are some countries in the world that refuse to compete against the country of israel but that is less a personal decision and more like a government instructional um decision um, there are countries that compete international fencing where if any of their athletes compete against someone from Israel, they could be sent to jail when they get home. So they end up pulling themselves from the tournament or um, 
having an injury where they, they're unable to compete. Um, so that is something that I've seen, but not something that I've experienced personally. There is a professional circuit and an Instagram page, um, just USA fencing. Um, they give a lot of updates on international, national tournaments, travel of athletes, stories of athletes, you know, routines and stuff, um, as well as, you know, links to live results and stuff. And then for the international fencing website, um, it would be www.f as in uh, frog, ie.org. Um, and then when it comes to why I chose fencing, um, I would say it's a mix between following my older brother into the sport, seeing my older brother be successful as a young kid, thinking it was really cool, you know, going to practice with him for years. It helped me realize like, this is something that I love. This is something that I want to do. This is something that I want to pursue, you know, with, with my, uh, as I got older, you know, and more experienced. Um, and then also, you know, having, you know, the other, you know, my other family members and, and support staff um, be there for me really helped me a little weight off the shoulders when it comes to, you know, not having to handle disappointment and loss all by yourself. Obviously, you know, I'm the only one that's competing out there. But, um, you know, specifically, you know, having like uh, scenarios like my mom telling me that, you know, my Polish grandparents, you know, are, are, are watching over me when I'm competing in Poland and, and knowing that, you know, I'm never alone because I have such a great, you know, system around me is something that is, um, I think, been one of the most important things in my overall success as a professional athlete. Um, in terms of universities for um uh, Foil fencers. Foil is one of the other, uh, one of the three disciplines in fencing. There's saber, which I do, which is the fastest pace. And you actually cut with the, the side of the blade where the other two weapons, FA and foil, you have to poke with the, the tip. So um, they are different um, weapons. There are different rules in the sport. There are different body types that are dominant. There are different training systems. Um, they're actually so different that almost no one in the world is able to compete at a high level in two of them. Almost everyone special, almost everyone, literally everyone specializes in one discipline and there's really no crisscross on the international circuit. Um, the example I like to give when explaining this would be the difference of a marathon runner and a sprinter. If you put Usain Bolt to run a marathon, he would do horrible. And if you did put a marathon runner to run a hundred meter dash would do horrible. Um, it's just, there's very little crossover. Uh, the Harvard team is actually very good, um, as well as the other big schools in NCAA fencing out of the Ivy League would be um, Columbia and Princeton. And then the best schools outside would be definitely um, Notre Dame, Ohio State and Penn State. Those six schools, along with St. John's, um, have over the last several years been the big powerhouses in NCA fencing. Um, so if you know someone, anyone with kids that are thinking about um, trying fencing out recreationally, reach out to me. I'd be happy to either get you in contact with a little club. Um, the sport is small enough where I, I know a lot of the coaches in, in most of the big cities in the U.S., um, and, uh, you know, I've either probably competed against them, had them coach against me or coached against them in, in one way or another over my 16 years in the sport. Um, so that would be something I'd be more than happy to try and, you know, help more kids, you know, find a club, start the sport, see how they like it at a young age and, you know, just get involved as um, much as possible. Um, let me see. Just want to make sure there are no questions that I didn't uh, talk about. Was there ever a time where I thought about giving up fencing? Um, hmm. I would say the only one time I actually, I don't know if I actually seriously considered it, but at the time the, I thought I would quit fencing would be the 2014 under 20 world championships in Plovdiv, Bulgaria. Um, I was coming off two great seasons in 2013 and 2012, where I had significantly overperformed at the world championships uh, compared to my ranking. At the 2012 under 20 world championships in Croatia, I got the bronze medal, both times significantly better than my ranking was going into the tournament. 
Um, but then going into 2014, I was ranked number one in the world in under 20s. Um, and then at this tournament, I lost in the first round. Uh, got my ass handed to me, to be perfectly honest. Um, stormed around in anger. Uh, didn't talk to anyone for a very long time when I got home. Just wanted to not think about the sport, not talk about what happened. You know, that was definitely probably one of the lowest points um, of my athletic career, just trying to figure out how it was possible that I could be overperforming when, you know, I wasn't supposed to. And then, you know, when I actually was in my mind at a level to be the best to, to lose and, you know, come in worse than a hundredth place or, or whatever I got was something that really, I would say, almost broke me, but did not completely, um, obviously. Um, but I remember sitting down like in a garden, just like still in my sweaty stuff in 2014 and thinking to myself, you know, if I do continue with this sport, um, I'm definitely gonna lose matches in the future. I can't win every tournament, but if there's one thing that I can promise myself, it's that I'm not gonna lose because I'm underprepared. I'm not going to lose because I didn't put in the work. I might lose because someone's better than me. I might lose because I had a bad day. I might lose because of a variety of other factors, but I, I pretty much then and there told myself, like, I never wanted to feel again. Like I lost because I didn't put in the work or didn't do the things that were within my capability to prepare myself for the tournament. Um, in terms of injuries, I've never actually suffered, knock on wood, um, a very serious injury in fencing. I would say, uh, like when I talked about earlier about these tournaments, you know, going 14 hours of, you know, very small but explosive athletic movements followed by long periods of rest and then, you know, warming up and stretching again, I would say my most common injury would definitely be um, uh, straining my hamstring uh, on my left leg. Just the motion of lunging, uh, doing like an explosive lunge is, is really tough on your front hamstring. So since I'm a lefty, it would be my left side your front knee, my left knee, my front ankle, my left ankle, and my lower back are pretty much the places on your body that take the most impact. Um, I think that compared to the general population of my sport, I spend a very long time doing my mobility and you know um, rehab just to make sure that my body is ready to compete at a high level and I'm ready to train at a high level on a consistent basis. Um, so, I'm hoping that I can continue with that into my later 20s, um, as is the goal. Um, as a fencer, we've started competing more seriously. Okay, when it comes to fencing uh, or starting fencing at an older age, I would say that it is definitely an uphill battle. Um, most a significant majority probably started fencing early on, probably 10, 11, 12, or the early teen years. Um, it is pretty rare that people get um, to be at the Olympic level if, they, if they're not starting in the sport at a young age, similar to, you know, like ice skating and gymnastics and stuff. Um, but I would say in terms of, you know, starting a little bit later in life, um, the most important thing would be to, to try and get the mental and like tactical like strategic aspect of the game and then making sure that you know you're putting in the work physically to make sure that you're you know you're capable of moving um and and you know being able to last 14 hours of competition for three straight days you know it's it's brutal it hurts you know it's not fun by day three uh, but you know, if you're competing at the end of the third day of a long competition, you know, if you're in pain, your, your opponent's probably in pain too. You know, if something doesn't feel great yourself, you know, something probably doesn't feel great in your opponent. Um, and it comes down to, you know, who prepared their body better for this type of, uh, you know, grueling three-day tournament and who prepared themselves better mentally for this type of, you know, to be able to compete when you don't, you don't feel your best. Um, that's one of the things I'm constantly telling the, the athletes that I coach at Harvard now is that I don't want them to only win when they're feeling good. I don't want them to only win when they're having a great day. I think that they're good enough that if they train at their absolute best, that they can win even when they're not feeling well, even when they feel like crap, even when like they don't want to fence, you know, everyone has been to a turn. If, if you competed in the sport of fencing for, for over a decade, Everyone's been to a competition where they wake up one morning, something hurts, something doesn't feel well, you know, runny nose, 
sore lower back, you know, a little bit sick, a little bit sleep deprived because of final exams, jet lag, you know, there's so many things that can affect, you know, your, your actual ability to compete on game day. Um, but I always tell them is that if you outwork, you know, all your opponents, you prepare better than all your opponents, you do the small details, the intangibles that a lot of other people aren't willing to look at, you can put yourself at a level where you're able to win, even when you're not at your best. And, and that's something that I've always thought was, and should be like the goal of training to prepare yourself to win under all circumstances, you know, whether, whether you feel having the best day of your life or the worst day of your life, you know, um, that's something that, uh, you know, has been really my, uh, I would say like philosophical outlook on the sport for as long as I can remember, um, in terms of skills that are needed for fencing, um, my coach growing up always described the sport as a little bit of, um, a game of physical chess where you need both physical and mental um, strength to, to be able to be a champion. Look at, you know, the world of, you know, athletes. There are people who physically are just gifted and, you know, can outperform anyone on any given day. And there are people that are mentally that are so gifted. They have such a great knowledge of the sport tactically. They know what they should do. Right. But if you want to be the best in the world, you have to find a way to to merge those two aspects of your game. Um, you know, one without the other is I wouldn't say useless, but it, it's not ideal for trying to make a you know, run at, at a super elite level. Um, in terms of sponsors, um, besides some like U.S. fencing and the U.S. Olympic Committee and like my support system at Harvard, um, one of my uh, fencing sponsors is called Absolute Fencing. Um, if there are any fencers out there on this call or um, any uh, people that are looking to start the sport, I would definitely recommend, you know, absolute fencing gear in terms of both quality and performance uh, of the material. Um, the company and the owner, Gary Lou, have been very good to me and generous to me throughout my entire life. Um, one of the main reasons I decided to sign with them after finishing my NCA collegiate career in 2019 was... I remember before this company was huge. I remember before this company was international and supplying, you know, you know, world championships, Olympic games. I remember being a, a 10 year old kid at a regional tournament at the university of New Hampshire. Um, when I was 10 years old with my mom and dad and getting my first set of like new fencing gear. Um, the fact that he had been with me and he had been, you know, someone who had supported me and like talked to me and been a friend to me throughout all those years made the decision very easy. Um, you know, cause I had a very close personal connection with him and the fact that he had, you know, been so, you know, kind to me and my family when I was super young, I wasn't an Olympian. I wasn't a national champion. I wasn't a state champion. I wasn't a local champion. I, I was a nobody in the sport and he still took, you know, the extra time needed to, to really, um, you know, go the extra mile to help me out and give me a little advice in the sport was something that, you know, I thought was super, you know, no more respectful of him. And it made the decision to sign with that specific fencing supplier, you know, very easy. Um, they're based in Bridgewater, New Jersey, but they ship uh, nationally, internationally, no problem. Um, in terms of um, what I had prepared uh, talking about, that is pretty much all I had um, written down. So now I'll just specifically uh, read through some of the questions if anyone has any more um, or if anyone wants to raise their hand. Some, I think there's a raise your hand thing. If anyone wants to ask a question you know, by voice, I'd be happy to, to answer it if it's a little bit more complicated. Um, but... In terms of the, the sport safety, um, it is a little counterintuitive that we are running around with metal swords and hitting each other very hard. The protective gear we wear is, is elite. The research and science that's gone into making sure that significant injuries don't happen often it has, has been tremendous. Um, I have been hit very hard millions of times in my life and luckily have not sustained any serious injuries. Um, so I would say that, yes, overall, the sport is very safe other than the possibility of, you know, a few slashes, a few bruises uh, here and there. Um, but yeah, I would 
I would say that overall, there's nothing to be scared of. The safety precautions, especially uh, in youth fencing and youth athletics classes are huge. Making sure that masks are worn at all times, protecting the eyes and stuff. Um, there's a lot of very specific fencing rules that make sure that especially young kids in the sport don't suffer any serious injuries. Um, so that's it for the, the, the questions that were written in the chat. So um, if anyone wants to, to, let me see if I can see the entire group so I can um, figure out if anyone raised their hand. Um, I see jo uh, Joelle Rubin, you have a, a question, I'll be happy to answer it. Are you able to make a living being a professional fencer? Yes, um, it is hard for a lot of um, you know athletes that graduate college that aren't already on an Olympic level to make you know ends meet to support themselves through training, through rehab, you know, personal training, nutrition. You know, there's a lot of pretty expensive. Um, there's a lot of pretty expensive, you know, areas that, that are required to, to make it to the top level. Um, and I definitely feel very lucky and blessed that I was able to make a jump to a higher level at a pretty young age, which gave me the ability to bring in, um, you know, enough money to support myself through training and, and, and live comfortably on. Um, but I would say that is definitely one of the most significant factors in collegiate athletes when they finish their senior year deciding if they should go work in the professional world or deciding if they should continue on number one factor that that makes people retire early in, in the sport of fencing um, most of the european and asian teams that we're competing against are training in a centralized olympic training center with a national coach and are government funded but the U.S. Olympic Committee actually has zero government funding. It's all private funding and fundraising and, and stuff like that. So um, the U.S. system is definitely a little bit more of a hustle. A lot of people coach on the side, kind of like what I'm doing, do other coaching opportunities, youth clinics, um, you know, speaking appearances, stuff like that. And then, you know, trying to find, you know, sponsors that are, you know, involved in the sport as well, um, you know, become easier when you make it to the Olympics. But it, it's definitely still it's tough, you know, NBA players, NFL, like MLB players, they are on, they get national and international recognition um, and viewership on a daily basis. Um, but for me, we have, you know, once a year we have the world championships, which is, you know, aside from the Olympics, our biggest event. The Olympics. Um, I competed, you know, an individual event for uh, one round in Rio because I lost in the first round, competed for around 15 minutes in Tokyo, made it further, but still both both the Rio and Tokyo Olympic Games, the individual event. Um, it was one day, you know, years and years and years of training all coming down to, you know, one day of per performance. Uh, it, it's tough, you know, mentally, um, it's tough to prepare so long for such a small period of time of competition that um, really makes us be grateful for like the big moments that we have and the, the, the ability to compete on that world stage, just even if it's just a few times in your career. Um, do, we, do we have any other questions? Okay, so, um, I want, to, I want to thank you for joining us for another program this evening, and especially to our speaker, Eli Dershowitz. I know he's a very, very busy guy, and I really appreciate him taking the time to do this because, you know, in between your training and your teaching and your coaching and everything else that you do and you're traveling all over the world, I know it's, it's really, uh, we're fortunate to have you speak, and we're really proud of you, to say the least. Um, I appreciate that. And I'm sure your parents are proud of you, I would have to say, to be very proud of you. Um, so if you're interested in presenting a, a program, uh, please contact me at uh, dbkravitz at msn.com or 508-735-9538. I want to thank everybody for being here. Look forward to seeing you in our next program and uh, have a nice evening. I think I just, uh, I just wanted to add sure. one thing. I sure. just wanted to add one thing before uh, everyone hopped off that um, even though it is very unlikely that people that start fencing um, in their later years will be, you know, make it to the Olympic level, um, Almost every fencing club in America has uh, 
um, like adult classes, even like big is um, a lot of the super competitive kids that I grew up, you know, training with uh, in Natick had parents that had never fenced before um, in their entire life, picked it up, you know, for fun, you know, uh, you know, after having kids in their later years. And, you know, it, it was a great day from what they told me, it was a great way to stay active. They enjoyed being in that atmosphere. They enjoyed learning something new and they enjoyed being able to, you know, share that with their kids, you know, at practice. Um, so if anyone in, in this room is, you know, interested in some way of either trying to find out if there's a local club in your area, trying to figure out if, you know, an adult class would be something that's fun for you, um, you can contact me either. Um, I mean, I'm sure David would be able to give you my email address, but if you would like it, um, it's just my first name dot last name at gmail.com. Or you could feel free to reach out to me on either Facebook or Instagram. I'm pretty good about getting back to people. Um, so, so I'd be happy to get any. So Eli, you. here's what we'll do. We yeah. need you to come to LA in okay. around three and a half weeks, March 31st through April 3rd. Probably not appropriate on Shabbat, but you know, we're we'll, we'll here. And the 67 of us that are going to be there will be happy to take up fencing as one of our active one of our activities if you can't make it to la since i happen to work at the harper coop we're going to try to figure out how to feature you upstairs on the on the uh, third floor in our event area and maybe i'll have all the locals that are on the call come and visit you and if that's not good enough we have a convention in 2023 that we're working very hard on and maybe because you're talking about grandfathers here so you're being very kind. <laughs> There's a few young yeah. ones, but uh, our youngest um, member that's watching tonight, Jerry, he, he's going to lead the charge, <laughs> Jerry Egress, and David Kravitz is going to be his assistant. So Absolutely. we look forward to taking fencing as the new official sport of FJMC. How's that sound? Well, I would tell you that the new national circuit in the U.S. now has a VET 40, VET 50, VET 60, VET 70, and VET 80 events that are there you often go. Yeah, there you go. We're all <laughs> we're all, we're all and set. a lot of the a lot of the people competing in them are parents of kids who took it up and did not grow up fencing. So it's a pretty even playing field of people learning. You know, you know how how the game works. It's obviously you know a little bit of a also like a community thing you know everyone you know they're, they're all friendly with each other so uh, it, it's a great community to be a part of um there's a few clubs in la i'm sure would be happy to host you guys if you wanted but um <laughs> whatever you guys want you know any way i can i can improve viewership of the sport you know i'm happy to help. that's great thank that's you great. for joining thank us you. tonight we really thank appreciate it thank you appreciate it all right good night everyone